Uh oh, guess what day it is? Thanks for tuning in to Talking Whatever Wednesday. I'm your host, alias Chuck Finley. Thanks for listening, and uh, I really appreciate you choosing to spend the next 20 minutes or so listening to another person talk, and that person is me, so I appreciate it. Um, You can follow the show on Twitter at TWWpod1, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Talking Whatever Wednesday. Feel free to give it five stars on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Um, oh, that's my squeaky chair. I am sorry. But you're going to hear that today. <laughs> um, where was I? Oh, yeah, where you can where you can find the podcast. Uh, we're on Google Podcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. And if you have any co- comments or questions, you can always e- email me at talkingwhateverwednesday at gmail.com. Now, let's get into some more stories of people who have escaped from prison let's go uh, so Edward <laughs> the first story I've got for you is Edward Wayne Edwards Mr. Edwards was a convicted serial killer who escaped from jail in Akron Ohio in 1955 and fled across the country <laughs> holding up gas stations along the way uh, he was born in Akron in 1933 in his autobiography he wrote that he grew up in an orphanage and that he was abused both physically and emotionally by the nuns there that sucks. He wrote that he was allowed out of juvenile detention to join the Marines, but he eventually went AWOL and was dishonorably discharged, much like WWE's Randy Orton. <clears throat> he traveled frequently during his 20s and 30s, working some assorted jobs. In 1955, he escaped from jail in Akron and drifted across the country robbing gas stations. He wrote that he never disguised himself during these crimes because he wanted to be famous. Well, I guess that's how you do it. He was placed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted List in 1961. After his capture in 1962, he was imprisoned in Leavenworth, from which he was paroled in 1967. He claimed that the inf- in, uh, excuse me, he claimed that the influence of a, of a benevol- benevolent guard at Leavenworth reformed him. He married and became a motivational speaker, like you do. Uh, he appeared on television shows to help to. Uh, to Tell the Truth and What's My Line. Let's see. Between 1974 and 2009, he lived in more than a dozen a dozen different states when not incarcerated, according to his daughter April, using many false names. By 1982, he had returned to crime and was in prison in Pennsylvania for two years for arson. That's different. All right. In a 1993 letter to the FBI found in his papers, Edwards requested his criminal and history records from cities in 19 states claimed that J. Edgar Hoover, quote, more or less gave me permission to proceed, quote, with his 1972 biography, quote, after I assured him there was nothing in it bad about the FBI. <laughs> and he was writing a new book about criminals he met while incarcerated, such as Tony uh, Provenzano, Charles Manson, and Jimmy Hoffa. Let's see, in 2009, Edwards was arrested for murder in Louisville, Kentucky, Neighbors described him as pleasant and neighborly. I mean, yeah. In 2010, he pled guilty to the murders of Billy Lovacco, uh, 21 of Doylestown, Ohio, Judith Straub, 18 of Sterling, Ohio, and Tim Hack, 19, Kelly, Kelly Drew, 19, both of Jefferson, Wisconsin. Soon after, in a jailhouse interview, Edwards confessed to killing his foster son, Danny Law Gluckner, age 25. In 2011, he was sentenced to death for that killing. Well, wait, just for that one, but not the other ones. Okay. I don't have any other details, but 
that's what I've got on good old Eddie Edwards. Not to be confused with the a with the uh, professional wrestler of the same name. <laughs> This next one is another Ohio guy. Uh, Frank Freshwaters was born on April 18, 1936 in Akron, Ohio. On July 3, 1957, Freshwaters was speeding when he struck and killed Army veteran Eugene Flint. He pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 1 to 20 years in prison. His sentence was suspended and he was given a 5 year probation. After violating the terms of that agreement, he was sentenced again to 20 years at the Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield on February 19th, 1959. The bird chooses to get loud as I speak. I'm so sorry. Freshwater gained the trust of officials at the facility with good behavior and was transferred to Sandusky Honor Farm in Perkins County to carry out the rest of his sentence. He escaped from the farm on September 30th, 1959. Though the details of escape, his escape have never been disclosed. In the intervening years, Freshwaters lived under, under an assumed name and sought work as a truck driver and mobile librarian. He initially traveled to Florida, where he obtained a social security card under the alias William Harold Cox. He later returned north and settled in Hurricane, West Virginia. On October in October 1975, he was arrested on an Ohio warrant in Charleston after authorities determined his identity. That's not good. But the community largely respected and enjoyed the presence of Freshwaters, who at this point in his life played the guitar and held a strong affinity for country music. Governor Arch A. Moore Jr. refused to send him back to Ohio and praised his flawless 16-year residency in an official letter. Moore wrote that while he had committed a crime, Freshwaters was largely a good citizen. He was released and went into hiding once again. He settled in the Mel uh, Melbourne area Melbourne, Florida area, under the name William Harold Cox by 1986, living with one of his sons. By the time of his arrest, Freshwaters was living in a ramshackle trailer on the property of Florida Senator Thad Altman's parents. According to J.D. Gallup of Florida Today, quote, he was a caretaker on the expensive marshland property, keeping mostly to himself while occasionally fishing and warding off would-be trespassers. End quote. Even though he didn't escape from the prison, Freshwaters became known as the Shawshank Fugitive due, due to his time incarcerated at the Ohio State Reformatory, made famous by the 1994 film The Shawshank Redemption. Some fun facts about that prison. Uh, it's also featured in various films, including Tango and Cash. And the it was used for various prison scenes when the prison was still in operation. Uh, Air Force One. It was used for scenes of a Russian prison for General Ivan Radek. Uh, Godsmack's Awake music video in 2000. Um, WWE shot a promotional poster featuring Triple H for their 2008 Judgment Day event in the facility. Uh, in fall 2018, the movie Escape Plan, The Extractors, with Sylvester Stallone was filmed at the facility. Hey, speaking of Sly, Tango and Cash. 1989 and 2018 again. Good for him for going back. Uh, the prison has a reputation for being haunted, and various supernatural and ghost hunter shows have been filmed there. I don't believe in ghosts, so none of that interests me. One that does, though, is uh, that in May of 2019, YouTuber Mr. Beast did a 24 hour challenge in the prison titled 24 Hours in the Most Haunted Place on Earth. Um, I'm sure my kids have watched that one. No, no shame to Mr. Beast, but th there's no such thing as ghosts. There's a place where only the strongest dare compete. Who are they? Karate Fighters. You control the action. Dragon Kick versus the Red Ninja. Thunderfoot versus Skull Crusher. You control every punch. Every kick. No rules, no rep.
referee no holds barred. Just no contact karate action. The man left standing rules. Yes! Each set comes with two karate fighters. Get your hands on the action. Monroe Hickson was born on July 8, 1908 in Aiken County, South Carolina. Uh, Hickson, although lacking a formal education, was said to have been intelligent and was an, advic an avid reader of the Bible, regularly carrying one with him. He is known to have committed his first murder on April 17, 1946, when he fatally shot David Garrett at Garrett's shop in Aiken. Uh, afterwards, he robbed the place and stole a pistol. A week later, on April 28th, Hickson killed Edward and Mary Bennett, a married couple who were working at the grocery store they owned. Before he died, Edward exclaimed to police, A big negro shot me and robbed me. And behind me right now is my chihuahua. She's parking at one of the other ones. I'm sorry. Let me go back. <laughs> I'm leaving this in. I'm not going to take that out. That's funny as hell. All right, let me go back. Before he died, Edwards exclaimed to police, quote, a big Negro shot me and robbed me, end quote. Did I say this was 1946? Because it was. In September, Hickson attacked Annie Wisberg at her home, where he stabbed and bludgeoned her to death. In October, he struck again, this time attacking a female liquor store clerk with a brick. However, she survived. He was arrested shortly after the last attack, but was not linked to the previous crimes, and was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. <laughs> During the investigation of the Bennett slayings, police were notified about L.D. Harris, who had left town for Nashville, Tennessee, shortly after the murders. Harris, who was illiterate, was questioned without a lawyer, in which he confessed. In January 47, Harris's case went to trial. His defense claimed that besides the confession, which they claim was a result of pressure from higher authority, which it no doubt was, no other evidence linked Harris to the crime. Spoiler, they were correct. Nevertheless, the jury found Harris guilty on all counts, and he was sentenced to death. His lawyers attempted to appeal his sentence by co contacting the Supreme Court of South Carolina, but they found no basis that his confession was involuntary. Uh, what? Never mind. In 1948, Harris appealed to the United States Supreme Court, and they noted several factors that made his confession involuntary. Harris had not been informed of his rights under South Carolina law, had no access to family or friends, and the persistence of the authorities. As such of this, in June 1949, the Supreme Court voted 5-4 to four in favor that Harris's sentence should be reversed. Afterward, Harris was released from prison. And on a very terrible note, I want to add, on June 23, 2022, the Supreme Court of the United States voted 6-3 to three in the decision Vega v. Tico that police may not be sued for failing to administer Miranda warnings. I just wanted to throw that in there. Things get worse. But I digress. On August 8, 1957, Hickson was arrested after perpetrating another violent assault in which he attempted to kill Lucy Hill Parker, leaving her with a serious head injury. In the subsequent interrogation, Sheriff Wyman Bush questioned Hickson about other crimes. After noticing patterns in Hickson's movements to unsolved murders in the area, Hickson Hickson confessed to having perpetrated four murders in the Aiken area since 1946, but claimed he was drunk each time he committed the crimes. Because of this, Hickson was forced and forced because of this, Hickson was forced and four consecutive licenses for each of the murders. So he got a life sentence for each murder. Oh, it's written kind of weird. On March 10, 1966, Hickson escaped Manning Correctional Institution in Columbia, South Carolina, where he had been serving his sentences. A federal warrant was issued the following month, but with no leads in sight, Hickson was added to the FBI 10 Most Wanted list on February 17, 1967. In 1968, a couple from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, came forward with information after identifying Hickson to a migrant farm worker who had, who had died on December 29th. A positive identification was ma later made via fingerprinting. So he escaped from prison and took up life as just a farm worker hiding out and died, I guess, somewhere near a farm. Okay. Uh, this next one I have really no details on. Um, in 1971, a 45 meter long tunnel was dug and 111 political prisoners, including president, future president Jose Mujica, escaped from the high security Punta Carretas Penitentiary in. Montevideo, Uruguay. It was the largest prison, prison escape in history. Huh? Teamwork makes the dream work.
Hello, boys and girls. This is your old pal, Stinky Whizzleteeth. This is a song about a whale. No! This is a song about being happy. That's right. It's the happy, happy, joy, joy song. Happy, happy, joy, joy, 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 joy. I don't think you're happy enough. That's right. I'll teach you to be happy. I'll teach your grandmother to suck eggs. Now, boys and girls, let's try it again. Happy, happy, joy, joy, 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 happy, happy, joy
are, are you back? Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Had, had the aft stairs, which uh, McCoy escaped in mid-flight by parachute. God. By parachute, after giving the crew similar instructions as Cooper had. He had obtained $500,000 cash ransom and carried a novelty hand grenade and an empty pistol. Why the no novelty hand grenade? That's my only question here. I mean, the the gun and the hand grenade are the only differences in that in those instances. That's it. A fake hand grenade and an empty gun. Police began investigating McCoy following a tip from a motorist that had picked him up hitchhiking at a fast food restaurant where McCoy was wearing a jumpsuit and carrying a duffel bag. McCoy had also described to an acquaintance how easy it would be to carry out such a hijacking. No shit, you did it six months ago. Never mind. <clears throat> Sorry. Following fingerprint and handwriting matches, McCoy was arrested two days after the hijacking. McCoy was on National Guard duty flying one of the helicopters involved in the search for the hijacker. <laughs> Inside his house, FBI agents found a jumpsuit and a duffel bag filled with cash totaling $499,970. What did he buy for $30 in the meantime? What? Just $30 is missing. Uh, McCoy claimed innocence, but was convicted of the hijacking and received a 45-year sentence. Once incarcerated at the Federal Penitentiary at Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, McCoy used his access to the prison's dental office to fake to fashion a fake handgun out of dental paste. He and a crew of convicts, Joseph Havel, Larry Bagley, and Melvin Dale Walker, escaped on August 10, 1974, by commandeering a garbage truck and crashing it through the prison's main gate. Now that sounds like D.B. Cooper. Alright? Ask... Go to the Obtuse Angles podcast, listen to their episode on D.B. Cooper. It's my favorite of their episodes. I'm plugging those guys right now on mine. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, Joseph Havel and Larry Bagley were captured three days later following a shootout after a bank robbery. Those guys were idiots. Three months later, the FBI located McCoy in Virginia Beach, Virginia. News reports say that on November 9, 1974, McCoy walked into his home, was met by FBI agents Nick O'Hara, Kevin McPartland, and Gerald Houlihan. McCary shot at them, McCary, McCoy fired at them, and all agents opened fire, killing McCoy. Melvin Dale Walker tried to run away in their getaway car, but he was apprehended after a short chase by FBI agents Rafferty and Bolin. Now, was... Richard McCoy Jr., D.B. Cooper, maybe? I mean, we'll never know for sure. Alright, everybody, that's all I got for tonight. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, my dogs and my birds also say goodnight. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions or comments for me, uh, give me an email at talkingwhateverwednesday at gmail.com. Uh, shoot me a tweet, uh, tweet or whatever, on Twitter at twwpod1, or check out the Facebook page, uh, facebook.com, facebook.com slash talking whatever Wednesday. I'm not gonna edit that out because it's funny. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Have a good night. <laughs>